Hey, what's up everyone? This is Music Tech Help Guy and welcome to part 69 of my ultimate guide to Logic Pro. In this video, I'll demonstrate mono recording and editing techniques for acoustic guitar. We'll double track the guitar and align the two guitar tracks. And I'll also talk about the basics of setting up for a recording. And we'll also talk about recording levels as well. Over the next several videos, I'm going to walk you through the entire recording and editing process for a full song, starting with the acoustic guitar in this video, and then we'll move on to recording a lead vocal in the next video, and then adding other instruments like bass, guitar, and real multi-track drums. And then later on, I'll cover other topics like making stereo recordings, recording guitar amps, and guitar reamping. So again, by the end of this series, we'll have a complete multi-track session that's been fully edited and is ready for mixing. These videos are going to be more episodic than most of my previous material. So each video will demonstrate the next step in the process and each one will build on the previous video. So I recommend watching these in order rather than jumping around. Before I get into the tutorial, I wanna quickly tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Ska. Ska Wireless Audio offers many consumer and professional wireless audio products, including transmitters and receivers like the Danny and Streetheart here that I use for headphone monitoring in my home studio. Ska has recently teamed up with Sirwin Vega, and they've created a whole new line of studio monitors with Ska Pro Wireless technology inside. They also have a new line of live sound mixers with Ska Pro built in as well. So if you run live sound for a club, for private events or your church, and you're sick of dealing with long cable runs, these are a great option as well. If you want to learn more about Ska, head over to ska.com or skastore.com today to see their full lineup of versatile wireless audio products. Okay, so first things first, let's set up our project for recording. I'm going to create three mono audio tracks. And one of the things that is a bit confusing if you're new to uh, recording audio is that even though we're recording with one microphone at a time, we're essentially gonna make three different mono recordings, the mix is still stereo. So one of the most common mistakes for people who are new to this is they'll think, oh, I need to create a stereo track to record to because the mix is in stereo. And you don't want that, and I'll show you why. Because if you record with just one microphone into a stereo track, you'll see that just the left channel comes through if you're plugged into input one. So what you wanna do is make sure this is mono by clicking here and just make sure there's one circle and then you can select whatever input uh, you want to record. So there you can see that we're just getting one channel of recording. If you record in stereo, but you're using one microphone, you're gonna end up with a stereo audio file with audio just in one side of the recording. So that's not what we want. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a guitar left track, a guitar right track, and then a vocal track. And what we're eventually going to do is pan the left guitar over to the left, pan the right guitar over to the right to create a stereo effect, and then the mono, uh, the vocals will be mono in the center. Uh, you can also change up the icons for these by right clicking or control clicking. So I'll just go to guitar and add in an acoustic guitar there, and I'll do the same thing for the vocal. I'm gonna put the vocal up at the top for now. And the next thing we need to do is set up our Q mix. So I'm going to use outputs three and four going to my SCA transmitter. Uh, and that's gonna feed a stereo wireless audio signal over to my SCA receiver. And if you wanna learn about setting up headphone mixes or Q mixes, check out the previous video, uh, number 68, where I go over all of that. But just real quick, what you're gonna do is create a send off of each of these, going to a physical output, and I'm gonna to go to output three and four. I'm gonna option click on those. I'm going to set them to pre-fader. And then if you want the click track to come through as well, you're gonna to have to click all. Here's the click. Let's add another send going to output three and four. Option click and set to pre-fader. And again, with sends on faders, you can adjust uh, the uh, recording or the uh, monitoring level for these separately from the main mix. 
Um, so I'm just going to do something like that just to pull them down a bit. But since I'm really only going to be recording one track at a time and I don't really have anything in my project yet, there's really not uh, much to monitor at this point. And again, I explain all this in part 68, but if you're just plugging your headphones directly into your audio interface and you're basically in, just in the same room as your computer and audio interface, you can skip this whole step of setting up Qmixes. This is only required if you're using a separate headphone monitor, uh, headphone monitoring system, or in my case, a wireless transmitter for headphone monitoring. Now, today I'm gonna to be recording myself I don't have anyone helping me. If this is the same case for you and you're trying to record in a different room, I highly recommend that you download the Logic Remote app on your iPad or iPhone, and you can use this to start and stop the recording, and you can even adjust the send levels for your QMix remotely this way. And if you wanna learn more about Logic Remote, I did a whole video on this in part 35 of this series. Now, Logic Remote doesn't show you a view of the tracks area, so you can't really adjust where you're starting your recording or you can't set the cycle range or anything like that. So there's really two approaches here. You can record the entire part from beginning to end, which is what I'm going to do. And if you make any mistakes while you're playing, just sort of play through them. Just ignore the mistakes and just keep going because ultimately we're going to have multiple takes to pick from and comp together using take folders and quick swipe comping. Another way you can go about this is if you have another person helping you, you can record things section by section. So when I do this, what I'll typically do is I'll use the cycle range as sort of like a recording location. So let's say I wanted to start here at bar 29, I would just set the cycle range to start at bar 29 I would set the end of the cycle range past where I want the recording to end. And then I can just hit R to record. And the recording starts at bar 29. Notice it also gives us one bar of count in and you can change the count in up here. You can set it to none. You can set it to one, two, three, four. So for me, I'm gonna keep this on one bar because what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start the recording right at bar one hit R, you're gonna hear one bar of count in, one bar of recording starting at bar one, and bar two is actually where I'm gonna jump in. So as I'm recording, I'm gonna hit record and I'm gonna to count to four twice, and then I'm gonna start playing. I really don't like starting recordings right at bar one because it doesn't really give you any room to properly edit the front end of the waveform before bar one. So I typically start all of my recordings at bar two. Now, before we start recording, there's like a few little things you wanna make sure you check. One, make sure that your tempo is set correctly. 120 is the correct tempo for this song. In fact, I may go a little bit slower. Let's go like 118. Make sure that your sample rate and your bit depth are set up properly at, uh, at the sample rate or bit depth that you want. I'm gonna record at 48 for this. Uh, you also wanna set up your buffer size under settings audio and make sure that the buffer size is set to a lower setting to minimize latency. And then one last thing you wanna check are the recording settings and you wanna check the overlapping track recordings here for audio and you wanna make sure that create take folder is set for both of these. And what that'll do is any overlapping audio recordings we make are automatically going to be packed into a take folder so that we can comp them and edit them together later. Now, one thing I wanna quickly jump in and talk about here are recording levels. There's really no standard for setting recording levels, but if you ask most studio recording engineers, they'll tell you that you wanna sort of make sure that you're around negative 18 dBFS. Some people will say negative 12 dBFS. The main thing is that you don't want to record so low that you have to add gain later, which will raise up the noise floor. So if you record too low, your signal level is going to be closer to the noise floor. Whereas if you record higher, you're pulling that signal level away from the noise floor. And it's not just any one recording where you're gonna hear the noise floor. It's a combination of multiple recordings in a multi-track session all having their own noise floor, and you'll be making gain changes to these tracks 
volume level changes to the tracks, adding effects. These are all things that can raise the noise floor. So when you end up with a, you know, a 20 channel or 30 channel session, you're having to compensate for all of those noise floors together. And if you make all of your recordings too low, you're ultimately going to hear more of that noise floor overall, sort of the aggregate of all of the noise floors in your project. For me personally, I shoot for around negative 12 dBFS for things like acoustic guitar and vocals. Sometimes I'll go, even go a little higher than that, maybe up to like negative nine. With drums, it's a little more difficult because they're very percussive and they're very transient heavy. So the transients, you know, might get all the way up to like negative one or negative two or negative three. The bulk of the sound is, is you know, not up in that range for most other instruments. So for the acoustic guitar in this example, my peak levels are around negative 12 dBFS. So it's not a hard rule, just make sure that you're recording at a healthy signal level, but also not so high that you clip or peak your recording. Okay, so generally speaking, I like to use condenser microphones when I'm recording acoustic guitar and vocals and other acoustic instruments. There are some exceptions um, and we'll go over some of those in the next video when we record vocals. I'll do an example uh, with a dynamic mic, a ribbon mic, and a, uh, a condenser mic. This is a Golden Age M251, so this is a tube condenser mic, so it doesn't need phantom power. It goes into a power supply that's over there. The power supply feeds power to the mic, and then the power supply is plugged into channel one on my audio interface. Now, in terms of uh, miking acoustic guitar, if you mic further up the neck, you're gonna get more highs and almost no lows. The closer you mic to the sound hole, the more bass you're gonna get. And if you mic in this area, you're gonna get sort of like this woody, boxy, mid-range kind of sound. So I generally speaking, try to shoot like somewhere above the 15th fret, but lower than the top of the fingerboard. Uh, another thing that'll affect the bass is how close you are to the mic. This is called the proximity effect. The closer you are to a mic, the more bass response you're going to get. The further away you are, the less bass response you're going to get. Uh, for me, for acoustic guitar, I generally like to be about maybe eight inches away from the diaphragm. So something like that. And I may just reposition myself here. Um, so yeah, let's give this a shot. I've got a uh, Logic Remote pulled up uh, right now, and what I'm going to do is select uh, Guitar Left and arm it for recording, set the playhead back to the beginning, and remember, like I said before, it's going to be a four and then four uh, count, so an eight count uh, count in, uh, and then I'll, I'll get going. And I should be able to play the whole song uh, all the way through. It's just strumming a bunch of chords. Yeah, and I slowed down a little bit there at the end, uh, so I kind of have to like ignore uh, what the metronome is doing in those spots. Okay, so now at this point, I can just hit the stop button. This will stop the recording. Okay, so I am back in the control room in my Logic project, and as you can see, I guess I didn't set the playhead back to the beginning before recording, uh, so my recording's way over here, but that's totally fine since this is the first take, so I'll just 
move this up to bar one. And you can also ignore this muted track. This is just my dialogue recording um, from earlier when I was explaining the miking techniques. So the next thing I'm gonna do is make another recording playing the exact same thing, but on the right guitar track. And this is called double tracking. And this does two things to the recording. One, it makes the recording bigger and fuller sounding. And two, you can pan the two tracks left and right to create a stereo effect. Even though here we're only recording with one microphone, we're still going to be creating a stereo effect with these double tracked guitars. For now, I'm just gonna keep them both panned center, but I wanna be able to hear the first track while recording on the second track. This will sort of work as a guide, like a timing guide to make sure that my rhythms are lining up and if I play a wrong chord or I get off in my phrasing, I'll be able to easily hear that. So it serves as a guide track to play to as well. And if you find that you're having trouble keeping the phrasing right, it actually helps to lay down a scratch vocal take because a lot of musicians listen to the lyrics to know where they are at in the song. Or if you're having trouble playing to the metronome by itself, you could try dragging in a drum loop or use drummer as a timing reference for recording. Okay, so let's do our double track now. And one thing I want to point out here too is if you see that your master fader, or your stereo output is clipping, like mine is here, but your recording levels are fine, it's most likely that the metronome is clipping the stereo output. So don't worry about that if your recording levels are fine. And that's exactly what's happening here. The click track, the metronome is clipping the stereo output. Okay, uh, that was uh, not perfect. I made a few mistakes in there for sure. Um, so what I'm gonna do is stop the recording here, back up the recording, and I'm gonna do another pass right on top of that same track. And by doing that, it's gonna automatically create a take folder for me. So yeah, you just record right on top of the previous take. And when you stop the recording, Logic will automatically pack both takes into a take folder. And then I'll repeat that process on the left guitar track as well. And I'll end up with two takes on each of the guitar tracks. So four takes in total. Okay, so I've got my two guitar tracks here, each with take folders on them. You can click on this triangle icon to show the two takes in the take folder. So here's take one, here's take two. You can select these using the quick swipe comping tool. Or another way to do this without opening the take folders to click on this little number here and you can choose your different takes. Now we just have two takes here, but when we get to vocals, we're probably gonna record three or four or five different takes at least. So it really helps to uh, stay organized with these things and, and also have options to pick from. What I like to do after a tracking session is bare minimum, do a quick edit and comp the recordings so that there are no mistakes. I'm not gonna get into like flex time or anything like that yet to align the timing of one track to another. But what I am gonna do is choose takes from the right guitar that match up rhythmically with the left guitar. And if you wanna practice this editing for yourself, I'll include a free download of this Logic project in the video description below. I'm gonna open up the mixer and I'm gonna go ahead and pan my left and right guitars a bit just so we can hear that stereo effect we were going for. And also by separating these into two different channels, uh, I find it's a lot easier to hear the timing inconsistencies. Uh, and one other thing I'll just point out here is I've bypassed my uh, headphone cue sends for now since we're not using them. 
So honestly, the very first take I did on the left track was probably the best take out of all of them. So I'm going to start with just take one up here, and then I'm going to use take two on the right guitar, and I'm just going to go through phrase by phrase and choose the uh, best takes that align uh, best with the left guitar. So what I like to do is I like to turn off snap mode, and then I like to use the cycle range as sort of like an editing range. So I'll just kind of be dragging this thing to the right as I edit. So you can see here in the right guitar, I played a couple extra strums there. So what I can do with quick swipe comping is you just click and drag over the gray areas. And what this does is it pushes that range up into the active take, up into the active uh, region. So what this is going to do is now it's going to jump from take two down to take one and then back up to take two again. And, you know, for something like this, I might even just decide, you know, what, let's go with all of this opening section here because too many edits can sound kind of weird. You know, the more edits you have, the more places you have for, for noise. And then, like I said, I just kind of like to use the cycle range as a way to uh, work in small chunks, work in small sections. So here in the uh, right guitar, I didn't, um, I was doing this like muting, this little Chucky muting thing. And uh, I did it in the, the first take, but I didn't do it in the second take. So let's start like maybe here and let's bring in a bit of that first take. Now, I went over a lot of this in my quick swipe comping video earlier in the series. So I'm going to quickly recap some things. The first is that as you use quick swipe comping, you don't want to put the edit points directly in the middle or on top of the waveform or on top of transients like this. I generally like to put the edit slightly ahead of the transient or try to put it like in a gap or there's like really low volume, something like that. Something about that one I didn't like there. Let's pull that back just a hair more. Yeah, timing was a little off in the right one. Let's pull that forward a bit more. You know, and I think maybe the first take is a little better here throughout. Yeah, so now we're in the chorus section. There's a little noise in there. Here, a little click. I think that was in the left channel. So what I'll do is double click on this. Let's pinpoint where that's, that little click is. Yeah, right here. So let's substitute take two just for like that section in the left guitar. There we go. So the little pop or click is gone. Ah, so we have a little timing inconsistency here. Okay, so right here you can see that the left guitar is right on point but both takes in the right guitar are slightly ahead, and I can really hear that uh, timing error there. So what can you do about this? Well, if you click right here, this will switch that 
take folder from quick swipe comping mode over to editing mode. So again, that's quick swipe comping and that's editing. In editing mode, you can use all of your normal edit tools and it essentially temporarily bypasses quick swipe comping. So what I can do is with my marquee tool, I'll drag over this click and that's gonna separate it. And now I can move this region around uh, just as if I was working outside of a take folder. So let's just shift that over just like so. Let's trim this back up here, just like so. Let's pull that forward and pull that back. And the great thing about this is it still automatically crossfades the edit points. There we go. So now we're back in time. And I can click here again to go back to quick swipe comping mode. That's how you can go through and edit the, the guitar parts. I'm gonna do the second half off screen. It's literally just the same thing a second time, except it, it comes straight into the, uh, the strumming pattern instead of starting off with the long tones. I'm gonna do the rest of this off screen and I'll be right back. Okay, so we're looking pretty good here. I um, used most of take one for the left guitar and then a few spots in take one for the right guitar. And I'm gonna answer another question here because it, get, it gets asked all the time. Anytime I talk about guitar double tracking, people will say, why not just duplicate your guitar take on another channel and then pan left and right? Isn't that the same thing? Uh, absolutely not. It's not the same thing because what creates the stereo effect is the timing and pitch variation between the left and right channels. If both the left and right channels are identical material, you're just gonna end up with something that's louder and it's not gonna have any stereo effect to it. And so that applies to any double tracking where you're panning left and right, electric guitar, acoustic guitar, vocals. So just doubling a track and panning it does nothing. You have to re-record the same thing and make a unique recording so that there's some variation between the left and right channels. Okay, so one last thing I'm gonna show you here is I like to flatten and merge my take folders when I'm done editing. So I just have one audio region instead of a take folder because when you try to do some further editing and some song arrangement, you'll find that the take folders actually kind of get in the way. Um, but some people don't like that because they, you know, what if you wanna go back in and grab another take uh, later on down the road? There is a way you can do this with track alternatives. So if you go up to track, there's an option here that says show track alternatives. And what that'll do is it'll add this little option here where you can create a new track alternative. So if I say new, this is just gonna create a blank track and the same thing will happen here. But if I go back to the A alternative, you'll see that the region is still there, the take folder is still there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy both of these, drag over both of them, hit Command C to copy, switch over to alternative B, and then just simply paste that in. In, in the B alternative, I'm going to flatten and merge both of these take folders. So all of those edits are gonna be bounced in place essentially. And if I ever need to go back and grab those uh, extra takes, I can go to A here and I have my take folder back. So track alternatives are a really cool way of uh, storing two different versions of content on a track. Uh, I'm also gonna do some quick heads and tails editing with the marquee tool. Just drag over that and delete. Remember your fade tool is shift control. So I'll add a quick fade to the beginning. And then at the very end, I'm gonna do the same thing. Trim that up, drag over both of these, hold shift and control, drag from in to out, and there's a fade. Okay, so I've got my guitar parts primed and ready for recording vocals. I'm gonna record a lead vocal part in the next video. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel to see more content like this. As always, thank you so much for the support and thanks for watching.